social sciences and, and the humanities and the business of government and thinking about the, the human good. Um, I mean, it's a, a fascinating thing about that period in time that people saw that there was a way of approaching things and thinking about things, discussing them, which would open up a, a new understanding, a new depth of understanding across the whole world. So it wasn't just a matter of the, of the natural sciences or natural philosophy, as it was called then, but it was about, the, about that whole project. And just to go back to something that Lauren said right at the very beginning uh, uh, about the scientific community, because it's connected to this idea of the ideal, or, or not the ideal, but the, the, the uh, maximally uh, meliorized <laughs> sort of social setting, right. is that the astonishing thing about the scientific community is its internationalism, is the fact that it is a pure meritocracy, almost, almost a pure meritocracy. Uh, the, the, the fact that, that, that there is uh, a set of languages spoken by physicists, by biologists, whatever it might be, which enables them to communicate and share ideas, uh, to challenge one another, to test one another, uh, is a very healthy kind of competition, sometimes a little unhealthy, and people nick other people's ideas and so on. But uh, generally speaking, it's, it's a very flourishing, a very vigorous community. And if only you could generalize that to other sorts of communities, and perhaps to society at large, you know, it would be... It would be great, wouldn't it? For example, honesty is an absolutely cardinal um, value of, of science. The whole scientific enterprise would totally collapse if we couldn't trust each other not to fiddle our, our figures, whereas the legal profession, for example, is essentially founded on the need to <laughs> persuade, not exactly in, in, against the facts, but at least trying to make the best case you can regardless of the, of the facts. Well, now, science now, doesn't not, work. You're not saying that scientists are inherently more honest. I'm not saying that. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. Science is. Science, science forces them to yeah. be whether that's they are right. or not. No, no, that, no, that, that's, that's right. What, that's, whatever their personal inclinations, the whole scientific just, enterprise depends upon honesty mm -hmm. in, in a way that the legal enterprise absolutely doesn't. But, 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 it, but, but it also suffer. Oh, sorry, Brian. Yeah, I was going to say, but it also has a self-correcting mechanism to yes. enforce that. Peer review and, Peer and, review and repetition of experiments. And so. But, but yeah. it is incredibly susceptible. And that seems to be because we trust each other. When someone does make, make a fraud, there's been a lot of examples of how far it can go because we presume honesty. We're, we're it also makes, so it's, but it's, it also makes it difficult. Out, but it yeah. makes it also difficult to counter. I, I know, for example, in the context of the, of the debate against intelligent design, which I've been a bar, big part of, there are, in fact, the, Disco uh, the Discovery Institute, which is the major proponent of intelligent design, they know very well that the end justifies the means and they're willing to distort the truth for that. And many, many scientists have a difficult time responding to that because it, it is very difficult for scientists to respond to people who are knowingly willing to to lie in order to achieve a political end. It's very difficult. Well, but, but look, let, let's, let's talk about this notion of truth, because that sounds like there's some final thing to be found. I mean, um, most scientists would subscribe to some extent to the philosopher Karl Popper's view of things, where you are constantly coming up with ideas, and then you try and falsify them. And so he would do piecemeal social engineering and so on and so forth. I think there is an idea that the, the general public does have a gen an idea that there is some final truth to be reached. And our, our, our somehow find the enterprise wanting when they read in one newspaper that there's a new study out con con which conflicts completely yeah. with the study that came out three months ago, uh, which caused them to change their entire medication yeah. and so on and so forth. So, so there's this, 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 this conflict here between ideal... Uh, how do you explain that to people well, when you're out there? There's a large part... I think part of it is the need to sell... I, I, all of us have experienced sell. this. To sell, yeah, to sell things. I mean, to sell papers, to sell other things. So that many times a new result is jumped on, first of all, by the universities who promote it with press releases when it may not yet be ready to be reported on, the journalists who then utilize it, and, and the fact that there is, um, and the need to always think that in order to sell, as Brian and I are probably more familiar with this, in physics, everyone, every new person has to be the next Einstein. And, and, and it's, it's, if they're not, it's not supposed to be interesting to the public. And, and so we tend to, I think, in our reporting of science, uh, uh, there's a great pressure to overplay things that are tentative, because science is tentative. And, and at the front edge, a lot of the stuff we're thinking is wrong, and that's what makes it interesting. But it's very hard to convey the fact that we're debating about exciting things, which are tentative and, and will evolve, we, it, uh, but rather to be presented as great discoveries rather than great little steps. Uh, and, uh, I, I mean, I think there is a, a uh, tendency in science journalism to uh, publicize the latest single finding, ignoring the fact that has been shown often by statisticians that the majority of published findings are false. Yeah, exactly. Now, that doesn't mean the scientific enterprise is worthless, because uh, all 
unsupported conjectures are false, as opposed to only a large, uh, a slight majority of scientific findings. And of course, you accumulate scientific findings so that after there are a large number of studies and meta-analyses and literature reviews are done, the overall picture of the truth can emerge. But focusing on a single study is as, uh, can be as misleading as focusing on a single anecdote. And really, there can't be, the, the, the problem with any kind of criticism of science for having uh, promoted findings which we later discover to be false is that it's only the standards of science that show that the earlier science <laughs> was false. And in a sense, science as a method, as opposed to science as an institution, the particular people who happen to be running the scientific enterprise at any one time, but the standards of science, in a sense, you can't argue against them because the only way that you could show any of the limitations of the claims to knowledge from science are with better science. It's like mm. criticizing rationality. There's something inherently incoherent about it because it's only by developing a more sophisticated rationality that you could criticize the rationality that's in effect at a given time. I think, I think Brian was frank the other day on the, in a panel when he said that you, what you're actually trying to do, and I know this was loose, is to try to accumulate evidence to distinguish this just-so story from that just-so story, which acknowledges that science begins, as, it, as we all have always talked about, as, as storytelling. You have to tell some sort of a story to begin with, and then you test it against reality. But That's right, but the one thing that I would emphasize is if we were better at communicating the larger framework within which science happens, which is it's almost unheard of for a new result to overthrow the past, simply yeah. wipe it out, and we're on to something Never. that completely erases everything that came before. Usually, almost always, it's incremental shifts in our understanding. We understand a domain a little bit better. We can extend our ideas a little bit further. And indeed, at the cutting edge, those extensions often will later be shown to be wrong or need to be modified. But the core of the enterprise almost never is thrown away, is never wiped out. And that's the bit that gets lost when we still, when we always think, oh, new result says this, new result says that, and we feel that everything is changing. No, no, the core is not changing, it's just at the edge. And I take, I'd get rid of the word almost. I mean, the, the, those, the great thing about science, and it's the biggest misunderstanding of science, is that scientific revolutions do away with everything that went before. Yeah. That which has satisfied the test of experiment is, no, is not false <laughs> once you discover new things. And that's, that's a huge public misunderstanding. But I want to jump on something you said that I think is really worrisome. <laughs> and that is stories. The public has this perception that science is a set of stories and religion is a set of stories and it's these stories versus these stories. But science is a lot more than stories. If it were just stories, it, it wouldn't be worth talking about. It's stories that make predictions. <laughs> and it, it's a view that makes predictions about things that can be then tested. And that's the whole point. It's, and I really do think that a lot of the public's perception or an unwillingness to, to sort of accept things is the perception that it's just a set of stories and that you can choose which ones you like best. No, I'd already contexted that yeah. with, with Popper's yeah. discussion. No, I know. I wasn't it's, it's, it's fine for you to make the point more, yeah. more strong. I think there's a problem also with trotting out Popper all the time because oh, okay. there's, a, there's, a, yes. there's a, a, yeah. a real sense in which there's a, there's a double standard whereby science is held to the sort of standards of Popper. You never actually prove anything. You only fail to, yeah. to disprove it. I mean, technically, that applies to everything. That applies to the fact that this table is sitting here and that it's sunny outside. Right. I mean, these are just hypotheses that have never been falsified. <laughs> but only science has to suffer this heckle um, mm. of, of, of the, the Popperian standard. And the, the, the public misunderstands this. You know, evolution is only a theory. Well, yes, but it's only a theory that we're sitting on chairs. Um, in, in, in that sense, in the same sense as it's a fact that we're sitting on chairs, mm. it's also right. a fact that evolution is true. Because one, one, one wants to add to the idea of science as an accumulating, self-adjusting body of knowledge, which it is, uh, and which a million <laughs> times a day, you know, every time you get in an airplane or use your mobile phone or something, via its applications through technology, is being constantly confirmed. And it's getting a lot of supporting uh, um, you know, data there. But, but in addition to that, in describing what it is, one wants to say something about it as an attitude. That, that, that science is, is, a, is a way of doing things, a way of thinking and of finding out and of testing it. It's a, and it, it, there's a very marked contrast between a, a, the scientific mindset, which is prepared not to know things yet, prepared not to understand things yet, prepared to be open-minded, prepared to, to uh, recognize that solving a problem may very well generate a number of new problems, and to be interested and excited by that to be interested and excited by uncertainty and open-endedness. Whereas there's another kind of mindset which wants a neat story with a beginning, a middle, and an end, wants closure, wants everything explained. This is characteristic of the religious mindset. 
and it's very uncomfortable with open-endedness and uncertainty, and not, not wanting to know. And there's a huge contrast between the fact that you can tell a, a closed, neat story which has got a beginning, middle, and end and a meaning in 10 minutes, and you can't do that with science. It takes you know, a, a certain apprenticeship to be able to get in there and, uh, and to be a con net contributor to the scientific process. That's not the same thing as saying that it, it's hard to become scientifically literate, because this is the point we were talking about earlier, that we want to encourage people to be scientifically literate. But to understand that, that this open-endedness, this uncertainty, the fact that not all the answers are in, that, that, that some answers create more questions, all that kind of thing, it's an excuse which is used by the people who like the, who like the neat closure type story to say, well, you don't know the answers, and there is uncertainty. We don't know how it began, we don't know where it's going, and to use that as an excuse for, for stopping thinking about it. And to come back to what Brian said, I think that meshes really ni nicely to his initial statement that, that the problem is some, somehow what we teach. It's, it's a lot e it's, that's a really difficult thing to teach, and, and, and it's a lot easier to teach a set of things you can test and moreover, I think, in addition to what you said, the problem is that the people who are doing the teaching are not necessarily comfortable with the science. And if you're not comfortable, if you haven't participated in the process and are not comfortable with it, it's very difficult to talk about it. And most, a great majority of the middle school science teachers in this country really have never taken, there's statistics, have never, have never taken science beyond high school. And, uh, and it, it, I think there's a real, therefore we have a real problem because we get people to teach these set of facts and not 